I'm Robert Scoble, and Rocky and I have been getting around the world visiting companies like General Motors, Plantronics, JBL, and in each of those places we see uh, 3D printing being used. And it, it, it's to the point now you can't uh, deny that there's a revolution happening in, in manufacturing, and it's largely started by American companies that are building a, like MakerBot, and now we're going to talk to Type A machines, which has gotten rated best in the industry of this new class of 3D printer. We're gonna find out all about 3D printing because it's Maker Fair weekend this weekend. If you're here in uh, San Francisco area, go see the Maker Fair. We're gonna find out all about 3D printing and type A machines right now. Who are you? Hi, I'm Kevin Roney. I'm the CEO of Taipei Machines. Um, I'm actually a, a long-term member of the maker movement. For a, a few years, I was a serial entrepreneur, mainly in software, but I became captured by just the maker movement. So my last startup turned out really well. Uh, retired for about a year, like showed up at a tech shop, got certified in a bunch of gear, and met up with the Taipei Machines guys. We decided to get together and create a company we think is gonna change the world of 3D printing. So, first of all, what what is 3D printing for the few people who, yeah, who no are like keep hearing about it yeah. and don't really know what Yeah, and for people that haven't heard of it before, it's, it's almost a bit of magic. It's these, these devices that basically take almost any object you can design in CAD CAM software, any 3D object, and take it and slice it up in, in digital copies, and then lay it down layer by layer and build up the entire object. So essentially anything you could imagine as an object can now be printed in various forms of plastic as a a way to demonstrate your imagination, your creativity, or your product idea to other people. And we have some uh, examples here, yeah. things with, with 3D gear. Yeah, yeah, this is a good one. This is a, it's a universal gearing set. It's a, a demo of a, a engineering prototype part that has got a three to one gear reduction ratio. The thing is, I mean, people don't realize, I mean, to do this in a machine shop, right, this is about $5,000 worth of labor and metal. If you did it as a formal prototype the old way. In the new way, with 3D printing, you can print each of these pieces on a simple printer, and this is about $5 worth of plastic. So this opens up a huge range of new applications on prototype. That's really the killer app, is prototyping uh, new devices, creative outlet, industrial prototypes and design ideas to help people get feedback on this core idea of what they're thinking about and get the, the feedback to allow that advancement of the product line. How many different 3D printers are there? I, I know when Rocky and I went to Plantronics, yeah. Uh, man, they had uh, milling machines yeah. and oh, they had yeah. machines that put lasers into liquid oh, and gosh. harden yeah, liquid. There's, and there's a huge range of, uh, of new uh, computer numerically controlled devices within the maker movement and then a, a, a large number of uh, startups in the 3D printer space and public companies. So the space is, I, I will admit, crowded. The thing we've seen though is I think a big gap in the market. There's a huge room for new addressable markets in 3D printing. The patent landscape is largely open. Many of the patents have expired leaving the, uh, the path clear for a lot of startups to attack the big guys. But also I think in terms of the startup space, a lot of the startups are really guys in a garage, they've done some basic modifications on the open source hardware baseline unit, and that's kind of like their whole product line. Uh, we've got this idea here of uh, a route towards building, we think, a big prosperous company on a specific target and the future of the market around desktops for engineers and industrial designers and the like. So we're only a couple of years into this revolution, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like the Apple II is out and now, it's true. now <laughs> we're uh, seeing like, like newer things come yeah, along. Absolutely. Um, you, you guys weren't the first startup in the space, right? No, I think, no, was no. that MakerBot? Or? Well, I, there, were, there was actually a bunch of stuff before MakerBot in terms of the rep wrap movement. These are open source hardware innovators. Really cool stuff within the Maker movement. Yeah. Um, it turns out that uh, MakerBot then tried to do some baseline innovations on top of that, made some early progress. The founding story behind Type A is pretty interesting. It's Andrew Rutter, our founder. He actually bought a MakerBot to try to get it to work, and it broke down so many times, he started to modify it to fix the problems. And at the time, MakerBot was an open platform, so we could modify it today's end. And so, after many modifications, it became this Frankenstein, and eventually it was transformed into the Series 1, a completely different machine that we now see before us today. And it, you can see that there's a design uh, similarity there's, between the there's two? There's some influence. It has the yeah. same look as that sort of like laser-cut uh, plywood, which sort of looks like sort of maker-crafty style. So we all come from that common heritage, but there's big differences now emerging between us 
and the other guys. What, so give us some of these differences and what yeah. should, when you're, when you're looking to buy one of these machines, yeah. what should you be looking for? So that's a, that's a really key question is if you are shopping now for one, there's just so many choices, it's a little bit overwhelming. Yeah. First, I mean, Make Magazine has actually done a competitive evaluation of all the major players in the space and we rated best in class with respect to the mid-range machine. We won that you know, tough uh, fought victory by, by being best in class on reliability, on yield, on mean time between failure, total cost of ownership. Things that really matter to people are not taking care of the printer, but rather doing prints. And for a lot of the other guys, they break down so many times, it's becoming very frustrating for people, and their new printer becomes basically a doorstop. With us, it goes and it keeps on going uh, for the long time. For the long term. And why were you guys able to innovate and come come up with a machine that, that goes more? Well, yeah, I, I guess I, part <laughs> of it is, more. yeah, sure. Part of it is that we've got um, access to a tech shop. We're based in tech shop in San Francisco. So as a small startup of just 18 people, we've got access to millions of dollars of capital equipment for, for rapid prototyping. We've got access to a water jet machine, a Tormac. So we've got a better kit than the other guys. But also, I mean, our core team of you know, pretty hardcore hardware people and software people, we've got, I think, better design abilities and I think deeper insight as to what are the key drivers of this meantime between failure and matter. So uh, I think the MakerBot's around $1,000 and you're at about $1,400? Oh, it's actually, we're, we're the cheaper one. Oh. They're, yeah, they're up at about $1,700 okay. and we're at $1,400. Got it. So they've got, it's interesting, smaller build volume, so they're, they can print only smaller stuff. Um, worse meantime between failure. Um, a, a bigger, more expensive maintenance cycle, um, and they cost more. Very cool. So that's Very how we stand out. So fourteen hundred for bucks. now, and there's and there's more in the future here. Yeah. Fourteen hundred bucks, and if I yes, wanted sir. to print some things like this, I need yeah. some material. How much does the material in? Yeah, so it's a, it's a filament called a polylactic acid. In fact, let me get my uh, there GoPro you go. Going, yeah, so. right. So yeah, it's a cornstarch derived bioplastic. So it can be completely uh, biodegraded. It can be recycled. You could actually throw it in the green bin for uh, for composting if you wanted to. Yeah, and the cool thing about us versus the other big public companies is that this is you know an open architecture with respect to filament. So look, if you want to use our filament, you could or somebody else's. The fact is, the big public companies are making a lot of money off of basically gouging people for the filament prices by proprietary cartridges. It's the sort of like the Hewlett Packard uh, paper printer model, and yeah. I think a lot of people are done with that. So we've just moved beyond that. We're going to build our business on the margin on the printers, and you know leave the filament for uh, uh, for cheap. Uh, so that's something to think about is the fil the actual cost of the plastic. Absolutely, I, yeah. I use that term. It's a little bit corporate sounding, but total cost of ownership. Yeah. What do you it's have? It's not to really do? plastic, is it? What do you call the, What do you call the material? Yeah, it's called yeah, PLA, polylactic acid. It's a small filament that uh, is extruded through the hot end, and it's uh, again cornstarch derived. And this is a little piece of it right there, but you can see it's a small little sort of uh, tendril of that material. Yeah. And you just sort of lay it down, you know, layer by layer to build up the object over time. So the hot end melts this plastic and then it glues on to the, the previous layer and just builds it right up. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And you don't need to use plastic, right? I, well, there's, there's actually a, a lot of material science. So we're starting with this polylactic acid as our first big, uh, big material. There's a lot of new innovations in 3D printing being pioneered at our shop. Amongst them are you know, new multi-material print heads. We're not on demo on that today, but that's, yep. that's coming soon. Uh, but also, I mean, all sorts of cool material science that you could pioneer with respect to uh, novel materials with really interesting characteristics on durability, heat resistance, and industrial applications. And I've seen even chocolate used. To, yeah, in absolutely. Ways. People doing food. They're doing. So how many? Uh, so you can modify these machines. To yes, use right. So we're, yeah, we're a we're a maker friendly platform. Okay. So uh, what that means is that uh, a lot of our designs are already hackable. So the underlying hardware, the mount points, etc., can allow people if they want to, if they're crafty, build on top of our core platform and make something new out of it. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, tell me what's in this machine. Sure, all right. Because it's not just a little printhead. Yeah, that's you know, right. So, right, so right, there's, a, there's, a, there's a frame that surrounds it, right? And, that, and it's the, an open uh, loop control system that moves yeah. the, uh, the head around. And a platform that can move up and down on the Z axis. So, it's a, it's a three dimensional control system. And what you do is you uh, first heat up the hot end and then uh, zero out the, uh, the platform so that the head knows where it is and that it will um, essentially move the head around and do the first crucial layer of deposit of the material on the, the platform and then move the platform down a notch and do the next layer. The main core of the system, the soul of the system, is a stack of electronics which is essentially an, an Arduino Mega and a Palula motor control board and we've got a new capability on demo today 
of a Linux bootable system. So this is really the, we're the first pioneer in the space with respect to a Linux bootable, network addressable 3D printer in the sub $2,000 category. And that has a huge range of, of big implications, but we think this is a big deal. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to be careful when I talk about a Maker Fair, but Maker Fair is this weekend. That's right. Uh, in San Mateo's yeah. uh, Fair, County Fairground. Yes, sir. Um, do you go to all the maker fairs around the world or just uh, well make, you know, like we're a small startup and... now so we're trying to very carefully control how we spend on marketing but maker fair is I think the main event that's where the sort of the epicenter of the maker movement is so we've got to be there we'll be there for and us. what are you showing if people drop that's by cool the booth? Yeah, we'll have a booth um, yeah. in the, the main expo hall and we'll be up there on the the maker shed stage uh, demoing some of these same capabilities that I'm showing you today okay yeah um, and what are we going to see today? As yeah, all right. Part of this yeah, let's demo. talk about it. So first, I mean, you know, we're already shipping units today. So the Series One is now available. This is new capability that we're working on. It's still in very early stages of development. So we're a startup. We're looking for funding. We're building out this capability. I'm demoing to you stuff that's even pre-alpha. So uh, you're really first to see this new capability. Cool. What's on offer is we think big, so. People who already have a Type A machine can't do what we're showing. Yeah, today right. Yet. The, the current Series One does not do this, but future versions of this product, when we're fully ready to ship, we'll be able to get this stuff done. Cool. And people who already have one can upgrade their. So machine? yeah. So there's all sorts of like backward compatibility we can do that will get uh, some portion of this capability for the latest machines. Uh, and for the latest models, will there be some gap as well that will only be addressable with the new machines? Okay. Yeah. And what what are we going to see? Well, what, it's really cool. What can so, we do now? That yeah, here we it is. Do yeah, before? right. So we think the new minimum standard on three D printing will involve a, a few core characteristics: it's reliability, like I've been talking to you before; it's that total cost of ownership; but finally, it's the usability. Right? Is that right now for almost every vendor in the space in desktop three D printing, and even the big guys, there's this almost war crime of usability around the software that's, uh, that powers the whole process. It's a seven step manual process involving you know, patching the manifold and re-exporting to a file format and then slicing it, it's a mess. So what we intend to do here is essentially revolutionize the space by shipping a device which boots Linux and has the rest of those capabilities inside to do the printing. That Linux bootable device then will offer a, basically a web server. You'll be able to control that entire process right, via a browser. Okay. Right, exactly. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an idiom of use, a mode of use that really appeals to people that want to do printing, not learn how to use these you know, really silly tool chains. That gets me into something. How, how do you um, build the model yeah. of something that you want to print? Well, you know, let's say I yeah. wanted to uh, take this GoPro camera yeah. and, and make a new GoPro camera. Right, or, uh, or a GoPro mount. We have a cu uh, one of our customers doing that right yeah, now. Yeah, all they these plastic a, mounts. Absolutely, yeah. So they, what they were able to do is uh, Self-educate on some of the free CAD CAM software, or you can actually buy stuff from all these vendors. There's Rhino. Is there any way to Autodesk. scan this? Or? Absolutely, yeah. There's a okay. cool app from uh, uh, Autodesk called One Two Three Catch. You've got to get on your Android, your iPhone. You take 20 pictures of the object all around, and then all those pictures go up into the cloud. They come back down as a CAD CAM object, and mm -hmm. then from there you could sort of modify and hack and whatever that same thing. Very cool. It's kind of a weird era we live in, right? That you could walk into any museum now and take a bunch of photos of some really famous piece of statuary and walk away with a copy yeah, and then print it on your printer. It's a, it's a, it's a crazy world. It is a crazy world. <laughs> so what are we... Uh, yeah, so what we're going to see, it's really cool. This is right. a, a three... A, the, the Let's first get the demo started. So here we it go. takes, what, 15 minutes to print what we're going to Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll start the printing pretty soon. So what okay. we've got here on the screen, if you could see this, is first uh, there's the, the main basic screen that outlines the, the terms upon which the printing happens. Okay. So that main basic screen is, is on display right here. And what are we seeing on there? I see an arrow and I see a... Uh, yeah, so that's the, that's the baseline screen of what, I mean, a, a basic user that wanted to just get going on print, they don't want to go through this complicated tool chain, they basically want to hit print and go. Right? So this is the basic screen that allows you to skip a lot of those steps and go right into the printing process. Cool. So that's this right here. If you want to do, for instance, a pre-print checklist to make sure that everything was ready to go, you'd hit that little green button. And what you see on the screen is a checklist reminding you about the key things you need to do to go through the process. And you can, you can do that if you want. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Okay, thanks. Right. And then uh, what we can do also is uh, go to the advanced tab and see that there's uh, other capabilities with respect to controlling the, the, sh the, sh the function of the machine in terms of where the printhead is, is situated, uh, appropriate calibration. Um, there could be leveling the platform. There's a lot of steps that we can basically hold the hands of the user for and give them a huge improvement in usability. Now you're printing on different colors and yep. stuff. So this chain was 3D printed. That's right. And this 
job on. Yeah, yeah. How do you get the, uh, you have, what, two or three Yeah, so right colors, now we, we mounted it with, uh, with blue filament, so we'll do our print in blue. Okay. Um, and so you have to think about that beforehand, what color do you right, want it to That's right, that's right. And out? Demo Maker Faire will also have a prototype of a multi-material print head. So we're going to okay. have the first really usable multi-material print head for sub-2,000 devices and a Linux bootable system with best-in-class reliability and a bigger build volume than the other guys. So it's going to be, I think, a pretty big change in the space. Very cool. Yeah. And so what, what process are we in in the demo right now? Uh, we, All right. We've lost connectivity. Ah, yeah. OK. <laughs> All right. We're having little Wi-Fi issues here. So we'll, yeah. we'll keep playing with that. Yeah. As soon as you get back up and running, wait yeah, at Yeah, just to take a seat when it's, yeah. Um, so it's an interesting market because what you yeah. tend to do then with these new capabilities is define a new minimum standard for desktop units. So these are be sub two thousand dollar systems that have really enterprise grade sort of like you know big company sort of capabilities. So right now big companies buy in you know, a quarter million dollar three D printers with all these sorts of fancy bells and whistles. We think that in this market for these new capabilities we could do thirty thousand dollars worth of sort of capability in terms of comparable machines for a sub two thousand dollar device. Yeah. So it's it for us it almost feels like it's the onset of the era. Um, of the personal 3D printer, much like in the old era right, of desktop computing when there was mainframes only, the onset of personalized 3D printers for enterprises, for SMBs is rather profound. Now, now this device, uh, when you print it up, yeah. and let me uh, sure. pull it up here, um, has many parts and it has some screws. Now the screws were in 3D printed, No, we, printed, yeah, we didn't right? print those, but you can actually design the entire object in CAD CAM software and make sure that it works together, all the, the, the grooves fit together in CAD CAM software and, and pre- yeah. Uh, certify the design that way, and then print a test part, and then see how it fits together, yep. and then iterate uh, with uh, respect to customer feedback. So that's the, the core idea behind 3D printing. The plastics themselves, I mean, you wouldn't be able to put this in an engine, for God's sake, but look, it's a great thing to show a prospective customer around fit, form, and function, and gather feedback and iterate over time. No, that's cool. Uh, now, when we went to Autodesk, they had yeah. parts that were metal, metal uh, yeah. 3D printed. You can't do that with yeah, a, so look, a Type yeah, A machine. The, the, the desktop market is really, we think, around deploying systems that would run you know, in a cube farm right next to your computer. The ones that can print metal, those are great machines, but they're much like you know, an advanced device like a Tormac or a ShopBot. They're to be run in a shop yeah. with negative vacuum control and safety equipment and earphones. You know, you can't do that on your desktop. No. Much, much like you can't run, you know, a table saw in a cube farm. You can't run a, you know, metal printing 3D printer um, out there. No, that makes sense. Yeah. And that's why you would go to something like a, a tech shop there you go. to get access yeah. to right. better, to right. better. And we would never want to sell against those guys. I mean, it's, I think it's a, it's a both hand situation. You prototype yeah. in these systems and do rapid prototyping on a personal basis. Um, and then move forward with respect to uh, other uh, printers if you wanted to do metal. What, what else, w when you get one of these, what else do you really need to learn? I, it, it sounds like you need to learn a little bit of CAD drawing software. There, there's some to learn there, although there's plenty of good sites like uh, GrabCAD and others which have free objects. You could just download them and then print right there. So you can get a copy of those ready to go without um, any CAD CAM. Um, depending upon your taste. But you probably get bored uh, after a while. You, you might might print your own thing, right? <laughs> you might if you want to design your own stuff. And there's a, yeah. there's a huge landscape, right, of CAD CAM software out there, right? So there's stuff from the big guys like, you know, uh, McNeil Associates and Rhino and Autodesk. But also there's a ton of free stuff out there, too. I mean, there's OpenSCAD and similar. So if you really want to apply yourself, uh, you can open up a huge world of possibility. Very cool. Right. How are we doing on the demo? We're coming back up. Oh, cool. Great. Okay. So we have to wait for the print head to get, That's to right. get warm enough. That's right. Yeah. So in, uh, if for us, I mean, a big part of the uh, advance in the system is not just usability, but also uh, avoiding print failures. So the system is reacting to different sorts of uh, measurements of its current status to make sure it's ready for print and ready to go. Now, how, how long would it take to print an object like this? Yeah, so it depends. there's pieces. a lot of variables depending upon both size, uh, but also the accuracy. If you really want to dial up the accuracy and have something super sharp looking, that takes a lot longer. To answer your question, this bottom piece was probably about a five hour print. Okay. This middle piece was probably about two hours. Right. So we're going to print a small cube in yeah. about 15 minutes, 15 right? minutes, yeah. Right. So it takes 15 minutes just to lay down that much material? That's right, exactly. And again, you can dial it up and dial it down. We, cool. have, we have prototype machines we've done that are you know, twice the size of this thing, and they've gone for a full 24 hours with a printing. 
for a gigantic stack of capabilities. So we printed out Ooh, that's three different propeller blades that we have downloaded from a NASA website, and then we, we like glue them all together. It's a big prop, the size of a Cessna um, engine prop, you know, uh, from our printer. So oh, it's sort of like awesome. a testament to sort of what kind of a durability we can do. The other guys can't, right? We can go for a full 24 hours, no problem. The other guys will probably break by then. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I I noticed you're, you've printed uh, chains, and these pieces yeah. are inter, are built interlocking. How do you do that? This is really cool. So that the chain is actually printed with the links already engaged. And what you've been able to do here is the cross section of each of these chain links is basically a hexagon shape. And so it's printed on the platform so that one piece of the hexagon is leaned over like that, the other like this. And so they're they're printed interlocking just like that. It's kind of an interesting idea around what you can do with respect to overhang on these prints. It's it's hard to print in thin air, but you can start to sort of lean out um, layer by layer over and make all sorts of complex objects that way. It's a form of the design mentality you really have to have to do 3D printing to understand what is an appropriate overhang and what you can get away with. Now you have five different colors here. We only have yeah. two different colors of, yeah. the, uh, of, the, of the plastic. Uh -huh. Uh, how many different colors are Yeah, the PLA with? comes in about 13 PLA. different uh, colors, even uh, if you want, glow in the dark. It's pretty cool, yeah. It's very cool. <laughs> Gold, some, silver, Some people everything. over in Europe were uh, uh, 3D printed some Google Glass uh, prototypes so that there you they go. could <laughs> act like they had Google Glass and they had uh, glow in the dark ones, it was really cool. <laughs> So that machine just booted up, and what it's been able to do is uh, home to where it, it knows it's supposed to go. And so it's completely centered with respect to its, uh, its three axes. And uh, heating up uh, at what temperature now, I'm not sure. Are we near 180 degrees? Yeah. Yeah, great. So um, why don't we go ahead and uh, go to the advanced tab there. We can sort of see what other capabilities are possible. This is the mainline control system for moving the head around, uh, monitoring current temperature, and uh, sort of overall status of the system. Where this is going is a whole stack of software, right, for not just controlling the printer itself, but also interfacing with the cloud. Yeah. So what you could do, for instance, is do prints and iterative uh, development and getting feedback. And once you know you've got the right part from customer feedback, from this interface, shunt directly to the cloud and tell a cloud-based manufacturer, you know, give me 10,000 parts or give me one in titanium. Yeah. So you see that sort of whole stack gives you in one small box the power of a printer that could cost you a quarter million dollars. Now to productize something that's been 3D printed, yeah. like, like this uh, yeah. fan blade here. That's a, yeah, it's, they call um, it an impeller. It's the sort impeller. of like the core of a pump. Yeah. Um, obviously you don't want to print that one off, you know, taking, over over five, again. taking five hours to cre yeah, create right. this, Yeah, that's right? prototype one off, exactly. So you would take this to what, somebody who would make a, a right. cast out of this? Yeah, well that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, the possible applications include you know, shunting to, to a cloud-based manufacturer for manufacturer at scale, but a lot of people are doing basically what's called lost wax or lost PLA metal casting, where the, the, the plastic is actually burnt away by um, the infill of molten metal. So you take that PLA object, that plastic object, bury it basically in sand, yep. and then pour in molten metal and it just burns it away. Wow, I wish I had this. You know, when I was 13, we had a metal shop and yeah. I would, used to build stuff out of sand, you know, cast. <laughs> but it would have been so cool to have a 3D printer yeah. print something it's, out. It's and pretty then put cool. It in We're the working cast. with the team that runs the, the USS Pampanito. It's a sub that floats in the, in the bay out here. It's a 1940s era sort of like sub that kind of works. Um, there's no other way to get replacement parts, so we're going to help them design these parts in, on our 3D printer and then do that lost PLA casting. So we're printing now right there, you can see. And Let that's me all been, get over here. There you go. That's all been controlled by the network interface uh, and the Linux bootable system that uh, allows us to remotely operate the system and then provide you know, guided feedback to the user about what's happening. Uh, this uh, layer that's being laid down right now on the build platform is essentially the first one that will be, serve as the foundation for the rest of the construction of the object. It's a crucial layer. You want that layer to, to stick solid on the platform so that it's a good foundation. Yep. And then as that uh, accretes up over time, it'll get just a good, nice, even build. This is uh, one of the areas where a lot of our competition fail. They have a lot of problems getting appropriately leveled build platforms. A cool feature of ours versus the other guys is we've got easy to level build platforms and an independently adjustable Z0, right? So, so you can the, see yeah, back that's here. Yeah, exactly right. So it's a single one finger adjustment for level in the build platform. The other guys require, you know, two hands, two tools, about 20 minutes. We can get this done in about five minutes. And these, wow. these, this platform needs to be very, very level. Yeah, it's got to be bang on level. I mean, you get, uh, you get the wrong level, and then the plastic will either be um, jammed, exactly, jammed too hard into the head, it won't come out, 
or if it's not uh, down far enough, it'll just dribble on there and not really bond. So both are big problems. So we see, you know, out in the wild, a lot of our competition failing over and over again. Print fails are happening substantially because of these failures to level the platform, failures to get Z0, and of course the very frequent filament jams um, of our major competition. So that's where we really stand apart. How do you, uh, what's the machine to, to melt the, the filament and why, why is yours better? Yeah, why is right. your print so better? So with, with some uh, concentrated effort you know, from the original efforts to sort of analyze the failings of, uh, of others, we came up with novel innovations on the print head that allow us to have well-controlled thermodynamics and better mechanical characteristics on adaptability to variances in filament size. Hope that's not too much verbiage, but you see where oh. this is going, right? Is that you know the filament that you get off the shelf, it might vary plus or minus you know two or three percent in, in diameter, and if you have a very finicky print head that will jam up on that, uh, you're going to find problems. Um, the cool thing about this platform is not just that it adapts to that, but also you know if there is a little maintenance cycle required to clear out the print head, we can be uh, done and back in operation in five minutes. The other guys take about forty minutes. Two tools and a lot of manual intervention. Tell me about what we should expect from Type A machines this year. Uh, different cases, yeah. different print Oh heads. yeah, so what, we're, we're advancing on, right. So we'll be announcing a lot of this at Maker Faire. We'll be adva advancing against the competition on major uh, different axes of, uh, of differentiation. So already we're more reliable. We've got this uh, whole new feature on network addressable printing. We'll also be shipping soon a multi-material print head uh, that will do mul multiple uh, colors and even support material. How many, um, different, how many different filaments can that print Well, let's see, uh, the, the first version will be uh, two different uh, uh, filament feeds, but it will be uh, actually uh, subsequent versions as many as four. Pretty cool. Um, and then, um, of course, these uh, a metal case as well. So this will get us to a whole new look and feel, uh, better aesthetics, more durability. Now, if you lay down a little bit of red and a yeah. little bit of green and yeah. a little bit of blue, yeah. it's not like mixing paint. You can't... You can do Turn a little bit of, a, of the mixing up. You, people do so. Some you can do something that it looks will, like it a will pixel. Be, it will be full spectrum, but you can do a little bit of that. Yeah, okay, absolutely. So yeah. you can play with some coloring and uh -huh. some uh, yeah. patterns That's on right. your materials That's and right. stuff like that. Right. So that'll be fun because so without having a multiple print head, you yeah. couldn't do that kind of yeah, like well, have a pattern. Well, right now we have people who uh, will do uh, part of a print in one color and then take that filament out and put a different color in, so they can do you know a split midway through. That looks nice. Yeah. It's not everything, but it's. But a if good start. if you needed to have you know hundreds of different color changes, as it, yeah. you don't want to do that without <laughs> a multiple of print head. There you go, precisely. Yeah, okay. you want the, you want the machine to handle that. Machines can do the work. Very cool. Yeah. So how are we doing here? Yeah, making progress. So there it is. It's uh, laid down that first layer, and you can see this this slicing program has gotten into the mix to basically lay down layer by layer a certain infill pattern that uh, gives it a, a, a characteristic density. Depending upon which parameters you set up, you might be able to make it more dense or less dense. And you can see where this is going, right? With the right software stack, which you should be able to do, and this is a path we're actively working on right now, yeah. is, is court as partners all of the major CAD CAM vendors, right? Yeah. And so then what you'll be able to do is direct from the CAD CAM software, go right into a one button print, and complete the object in one go without any fuss, any worry. Cool. Uh, our best competitive intelligence is that nobody else is uh, uh, even that close to getting to this outcome soon. Um, I think this is the first time in a live demo uh, of anybody in the you know desktop 3D printing space showing this kind of capability and showing the way ahead for uh, for the others. That's now really I expect cool. some of them to try to catch up, right? I mean, it's competitive space. The fact is, we've got you know really a, a solid team which knows both so software and hardware, and with access to Tech Shop and all that prototyping gear. I think we're the, the team to beat, uh, not just for the Bay Area, but for, uh, for the space. Where, where do you think this industry is going? Is it still going to be hardware driven or is it going to be largely software driven? Well, yeah, that's on? a good question. I feel like a lot of the players in the space now, they're very hardware focused and have mainly that as their core competency on the team. And we've got strong people on the team in that same regard. But the way I think to outcompete the rest of the field is to have deep competency, tight execution in both software and hardware. If you Give want me some to, ideas of how software would be differentiated yeah. going, going forward. Yeah, well here it is. One thing is, is that you know, more advanced workflow that would help people walk through the process of getting ready for a print or recovering from a failed print, those are hard problems to solve. And right now, it's just basically forced back upon you. The machines that are out there right now are dumb and give you a problem to solve and you have to figure it out. But most people that want to be industrial designers or engineers, they don't want to learn that stuff. They just want to get the print solved. So they want the machine to give them access to uh, appropriate assistance. 
but there's a lot more, right? I mean, yeah. you could imagine really advanced workflows, like for instance, it could be the cloud stuff that I mentioned before, or it could be parallelizing workflows. Uh -huh. So you could say, hey, I want to print this big complex part. We've actually got soon a, a demo uh, published in a magazine called 7 by 7 of one big statue made out of 22 separate parts. So the right software stack could help parallelize, excuse me, parallelize the printing of these objects um, it, and, and get something done in, uh, way faster than If possible. I was at General Motors, I would yeah. probably ask for a budget to buy a, you know, 10 or 15 there of you these, go. right? Exactly. Because if I'm building a car at any scale, right. yeah. I'm going to need to print out exactly. multiple pieces all at the same time you, to have that done in you, time. You exactly see where we're going, right? Is that uh, you know, a wall of these printers would be cheaper than one printer from the big guys. And a wall of these printers is a massively parallel operation could do a way more, way faster. And that's only possible right by the software. Interesting. Right. Tell me about the company that you're building behind this. Yeah, well it's called Taipei Machines and it's yeah. a startup that's been around for about a year or so. Um, we actually, all, it's amazing, we all met up at Tech Shop. We're all just sort of like uh, hardware software hackers. And um, you know Andrew Rutter, the founder, he got the first prototype going and yeah. uh, more and more of us sort of met him at the tech shop. We banded together thinking there was an opportunity in the space. So um, I, uh, I become the CEO. Um, I'm also the first investor in the company. That's all gone into R&D. And we're now on the quest to find you know, more investors. No, so cool. yeah, what we'll be able to do is uh, with the right next uh, tier of investment, bring this up to a whole new level. I, knowing Silicon Valley investors, they're probably afraid of hardware like this. <laughs> you, even though they we, are, yeah, they are. Man. You know, Silicon Valley's it's, had a it's good run of uh, hardware companies. Yeah, you know, yeah, from uh, right. Hewlett Packard on, yes. on I tell up you, to I mean, Apple. I, yeah, a lot of these investors, man, they just they just go in packs. They're kind of like a little bit of sheep. You know, one guy at an investment uh, conference, he said, you know, I just, I, I mean, if I'm going to fail, I prefer to fail at something, you know, I already know. Right, and I don't know of hardware, so I don't want to do it. Right, they're sort of they're fearful, right, yeah. uh, of the hardware thing. The thing is, we we're in touch with a couple of key ones who actually do have what it takes to back hardware, and understand how big this is. Right, I mean, I think it's true that software can be a more efficient investment alternative if you if you're investing in Facebook or Google, right. Yeah. But I mean, the economics on this thing are solid. We've got a great path towards fat gross margin, a good execution plan. Um, I think that this investment opportunity is way bigger than most of the other sort of like wannabe uh, next Facebook or cloud computing operations that are trying to get into the mix. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, uh, some of the arguments we've had about Google Glass lately yeah. is, oh, this won't go mainstream. It's too weird. You yeah. Know? yeah. What, what, what is it going to take to get somebody like my dad, who's not a, in the yeah. maker movement, yeah. Right. to buy one of these things well, and uh, you know, feel like he has yeah. to have one in the house. I, yeah. think that, I think that you know, people need to understand that really at this phase of the 3D printing revolution, uh, the most important target market are makers, um, engineers, industrial designers. I don't think the space is ready for my mom or, or your dad, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just it's not there yet. There's a lot to learn, there's a lot to sort of digest. Eventually, with the right software stack, with the right sort of usability features, you could put the, the power of these systems within grasp of people that you know don't want to be specialists, uh, but we're not there yet. Yeah, like, you know, I remember when Steve Wozniak showed me his uh, color dye sublimation printer, yeah. which back in '89 cost yeah. forty-five thousand dollars, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> and it was one of the first color printer, color photographic printers yeah. that I'd ever seen. Yeah, and now a seventy-dollar printer does a there better you go. job, right? Right. right. Exactly. And it's easier to use and gives a better output. Yeah, so the price was too high, but probably also the technical sophistication required to use the system was just way beyond. Oh, and let's not talk about the $45,000 RAM disk he had. <laughs> so he had $90,000 to basically print Photoshop 1.0 right. stuff. And, and probably a pretty complicated tool chain to sort of light it up as well. Right. But so it, shows, it shows what can happen in 20 years, yeah. you know, that you start out with a toy that the rich boys or a big corporation can afford. That's right. And it comes down and down and That's down right. in price That's and right. goes up in, in uh, That's right. Right. Utility. Both in terms of Moore's Law and in terms of cultural adaption, but also in terms of the advancement of propelled by startups to uh, make the usability easier. Yeah, and that's why I say we're only, what, three or four years yeah, into there's, this? Yeah, there's many chapters left in the story. It's, uh, it's a pretty cool space. You know, yeah. So take this uh, another 10 years, you're going to see this get cheaper and faster. I think you're right. Faster. I think you're right. That's right. That's right. And you could also imagine, I think, uh, just it creating a lot of consequences for you know the future of, say, uh, small and medium businesses. I mean, we have actually customers now using these devices to print uh, the products that they sell. So it's not mass manufacture, but it's a personalized, customized form of manufacture which works in small runs. Right? For people around the, because we have a worldwide audience and a lot of people haven't been to a Maker Fair. What happens yeah. at a Maker Fair? In oh my God, it's such a blast. I've been going for uh, five years now and it's, it's a great family event. But it's this, it's this uh, 
gathering of people who are makers, entrepreneurs, inventors. Some are going there for creative outlets, some are yeah. going there for talking about products. But it's all about people who are doing creation, essentially of physical objects, devices, um, and, and ideas. Everything from industrial stuff to yeah. uh, these art cars. Oh my know, gosh, those are great. Yeah, or these, these fire-breathing kinetic sculptures, really cool, right? Yeah, um, and, and a, a ton of fun electronics projects as well. People doing sort of, you know, craft computer devices, uh, robots, phones, what have you, yeah. It's a, it's a blast, um, very intense stuff. A lot of people come every year. Um, a great family event, I mean, kids love it too. Yep. But I think for a lot of people, it's sort of an idea about what you can get from a, a interesting fusion, right, of a technical culture and creative culture um, expressed with, uh, with liberty and enthusiasm. Very cool. So uh, let's check back in on our little yeah. uh, project here and see how it's going. On the way, yeah, we're about, uh, I'd say, halfway up. I'm pretty good out. And you can see what it's doing. It's making room for a little insert. You'll be able to, uh, after it's done, insert a little penny in there, and that will be the uh, action that will pop off the top of a bottle cap. So the, uh, the plastic piece we're printing is the handle, and the uh, penny on the insert is the, uh, the, uh, the lever action that will pop off the top of it. Very cool. Um, you can see how complex these things can, can become. Yes. You yeah. Know, this I mean, is a fairly that's the thing about three D printing is that you know you can think of and create objects that are makeable no other way. The complexity, the dynamics, the internal structure is really impossible to do with you know modern machinery with, without a three D printer. Now, if it doesn't come out right, it, 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 this one took is taking fifteen minutes that's to print. That's right. Yeah. If it doesn't come out right, the penny yeah. doesn't fit in there. Yeah. Then we just adjust it in the CAD software a little bit and yeah. reprint it out. It's true. That's right. And, and that's, that's where a, a lot of the state of the art is right now. That's one of the, I think, the big advances that we're going to be able to pioneer here at Type A Machines with the software stack is to help people understand, if it didn't go according to my plan, how do you help me make it better, right? Could I size it differently? Could I adjust the infill or the density? Could I maybe change materials? And so sort of having an embedded system to hold people's hands through the process of debugging the print is big for us. And like for a lot of people that you know, aren't used to 3D printing, they expect it to be just like a paper printer. Like yeah. you send it the job and it gives you the object. But you know, I'm afraid to say that's not where anybody in 3D printing is right now. It's, it's a more complex operation, so it requires more you know, effort to get to an appropriate yield. So that's why we're uh, trying to advance down this path so fast. No, no, this is, this is cool stuff. Yeah. Um, where do we read more about this? You know, if you buy one of these, yeah. should you buy Make Magazine as well? Well, they, that... they, they put together a very extensive review of all of the players in the space. I think over 25 players were in the mix. Wow. Yeah. I didn't yeah. even realize there was. I, Oof, I know, yeah. There's a lot of people um, that have ambitions in the startup space. Um, many of them are, you know, I mean, really uh, great inventors and creators. I don't think they're all really companies. They're sort of like, you know, ideas on a website. Yeah. Um, but you know, they're trying to make progress. Uh, but yeah, Make Magazine, that's the place I think to go. They've got a lot to offer with respect to not just make culture, but also in-depth reviews and characteristics that matter to potential consumers on um, all these printers. At tech shops, because there's eight tech shops around the, uh, yeah. around the United yeah. States, um, and I visited the one in San Francisco, we have a whole video yeah. where I think we met yeah, you. Yeah, that was that's great. What, yeah, yeah. That's how I first met up with you guys. I was like, <laughs> oh, this is a cool company <laughs> being built right in the middle of this yeah. machine shop, basically. Can you rent? Uh, you can, can right. Can you rent 3D space? Yeah, yeah. So uh, at the SF Tech Shop, there's uh, two Series 1s uh, they're running right now. And that's an interesting anecdote. I mean, they, they decided to put ours on the floor because they had such trouble with bad maintenance problems with the other guys. So it was our first sort of like, competitive takeout. You know, not just us doing marketing, but you know, really people are responding to the problems of the other vendors in the space. We've got better reliability, so that's the main line units on the floor now. No, oh, very cool. Yeah. Well, I can't but wait it, to see what you guys do next. It's pretty crazy. It's a huge future. Space yeah, so done. much potential. And this this space is opening up all sorts of innovation. I mean, I, the speaker designer, you know, uh, t told me that it lets him design new kinds of speakers yeah. in far less time than he's right. been able to, you know, try out before. That's right, exactly. Sort of like that access to your own personal 3D printer allows you to do iterative design at a much more rapid pace. Right? Yeah, so we saw it at SRI last week too. We'll have that video up uh, this weekend as well, uh, where they did 3D augmented binoculars, and the binoculars were 3D printed as well. So <laughs> oh my gosh. It's, it's a lot of fun seeing how this product is being used and, yeah. and how it's reshaping manufacturing in the yeah, world. Yeah, yes. Actually, let's talk about that. All right, let's do it. Because we hear about uh, 
manufacturing is coming back to the United States. Yes. Right? The yeah. Google Glass, in fact, inside, uh, let me see, let me read it so it's accurate. It <laughs> says, um, designed in, by Google, assembled in California, <laughs> right? Which, which doesn't yeah. mean much because there's not, there's one screw in this thing. So. <laughs> so, final assembly might have happened here, yeah. Or maybe a lot of the components were bought somewhere else. Well, yeah. there's a TI chip and a, yeah, there's, you know, a projector that came from China or something yeah. and yeah. batteries that yeah. came from somewhere else. Right. So really, was this made here or not? But we're, we are seeing manufacturing come back here. You now, it's not, are. it's not jobs. Because <laughs> 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 like, this thing is manufacturing something right now, but there's yeah. no human really involved or yeah, very true. little human. Although, involved. you know, we have plans to open up um, as we grow and uh, take more investment, uh, more and more manufacturing. And fi our plans are for final assembly here in the States. Now, we might outsource some of the I'm not even, I wasn't talking about making yeah. the machine. Yeah. The, I was the, talking yeah, about people right. who were gonna buy your exactly, machine to make right. things, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, no, but I think um, having, having access to this kind of like manufacturing infrastructure, I think has a profound implications for reindustrialization here in the US. I mean, I actually, you know, in high school, grew up in the Detroit area. So during the 80s, um, the sort of like the, the gut-wrenching uh, disassembly and disappearance of our, our domestic automobile industry was a very real experience for me. It was hard to watch. Um, so it's very important to me to sort of see what we could do to create more accessible jobs here. Yeah. And to me, it feels like, you know, these sorts of uh, manufacturing forms of infrastructure open up the possibility of mass customization of new forms of prototyping capability that could lead to, you know, shorter runs um, of accessible, quick response and agile manufacturing that seem better positioned to be here based in the U.S. rather than overseas. Now, I'm not against, you know, collaborating with other countries. I mean, there's a lot, still a lot of room for collaboration. But I think specific forms of industry manufacture could be quite appealing onshore, like mass customization. It, now, if I was a chocolatier, uh, how, how do I adjust the machine to print chocolate? Because I've seen somebody yeah. do that. And it's, it's pretty, it's pretty it's, cool. So what you're able to do for uh, all these platforms, which are sort of maker friendly, is you know, have enough interfaces so that you could hack the machine on your own and do something different. So we have people doing all sorts of hacks on top of these core devices. One is to sort of uh, have a, basically a funnel-based input for sort of ground-up chocolate that would just sort of melt it down and then extrude it through a fine nozzle, and then a fan to cool down the chocolate once it's hit the table and sort of gum it up so that it sort of has some sort of integrity. So that's the kind of hack that you can do on top of our core, lab, core platform. Do you guys, guys doing uh, hacks on top of our platform where they're, it's, they're at biotech companies and they want the 3D head to sort of move around instead of emitting you know, uh, molten plastic, it's sort of like dropping droplets of, uh, you know, from a titration system for sort of seeding different uh, vials and tubes with appropriate samples. So it helps automate processes that way. So they like our rigs so much, they've sort of repurposed purposed it for stuff we never intended. Wow. Yeah. Very kind of cool. Amazing, yeah. Are you guys hiring? Oh, yeah. hell yeah. So um, what kind of people are you? Well, yeah, for? we're uh, uh, coders, industrial designers, and of course, uh, people that can work the assembly line. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Got them coats this time. All right, all right, I'll try to. There it is. Yay! Awesome, there it is, print complete. Wow! Yeah, so, all wrapped up here, here we go. Let's see, platform's leveled down at the bottom. I'm gonna snap it out now, here we go, just print it down. There it is. I just need to get the right perspective here, like this. Pop up plate. There it is. That's the print. That's on pretty tight, right? So that's the right uh, kind of solidity so that you want to make sure that the print comes out well. Let me just take a little implement here down beneath. Might take a little vigor to get it off. Let me just try to fit that under. If you slice yourself, my he 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 my hits go up. So That'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, my gosh. Maybe I should just rip it off. Could I do that? Now this is interesting. So it actually you want it to be solid because you know the thing is if if it uh, if it slides off during the print, it's a problem, right? There it is. Cool. Wham! So you've got here a uh, a bottle opener. You put a little uh, penny in there. I might even got one. Let's see. It's in my pocket here. There it is, right there, and it slides in just like that. Mm-hmm. There it is. And now we can drink beer. There it is. Rocky, yeah. let's go get a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Time for brews. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. So it took about 20 minutes to print that. That's right. That's right. There it is. 
Uh, and you could do it faster or slower depending upon what you want for uh, accuracy. But uh, that's, uh, that's. And this was done at a what medium accuracy? It's about it's about medium. That's right. Yeah, yeah. you can slow it down a notch and get higher. And all the, all these three D printed items have that kind of funny feel to them uh -huh. because of how. Yeah, the it's thing is, just a little bit of post processing, and you can make that absolutely smooth, right? So we have people doing jewelry, right? So they they have an outer layer of uh, coating which has got, you know, metals inside, so it looks like uh, jewelry grade sort of finish to it. So with a little bit of uh, extra treatment, it'll look very presentable. So this is fresh off the printer. Very cool. Yeah. So where, where do I learn more about this? If I'm interested in the 3D maker movement or Type A machines? Yeah, yeah, well definitely come to typeamachines.com. You've got uh, access there to not just um, the platforms that we're now selling, but also a, an active forum for discussion of uh, the appropriate uh, you know, techniques to get into 3D printing. I'd also think about dropping on by your local tech shop there's tons of good classes there on CAD CAM software and a lot of maker culture. Always, if you can, show up at a maker fair. There's just tons of uh, good you know, coaching and inspiration there. Yeah. Um, and my gosh, there's so much media storm and, and hype on 3D printing. It's almost too easy now to find a website that will address this matter. So it's, there's stuff all over. And, Very cool. and watch out for us. We'll be out there making yet more waves. Very cool. cool. Type A machines. Type A machines, that's right. Thanks so much well, thanks for, for coming by and bringing this by. Mm -hmm.